I think you made the best choice with the, 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 the going with the softer read. Yeah. Just, just between not just saxophone stuff and the alto stuff in particular. Yeah. Um, all these years of playing, I really do think, and you might already know this stuff, you know, maybe I'm late to the game, but I think the template should be how soft can I play the reed and still play it? Yes. As, as instead of how hard must the reed be before I, you know, yeah, the other, I think it's the other way around. Yes. Yeah, and then to err on the side of a, uh, it, maybe not to err at all, but rather than the yardstick being, how well can I play with the reed hard? Is how well can I play? I project and everything, and everything else with the reed not being, how soft can I play the reed and still be this is fine? Yeah. And then make your adjustment with that, like which basically is not very non-pressure. Yeah. You don't squeeze at all. Not at all. Yeah. And then that's, see, that's because there might be an art in playing a song to read and putting power through there without it closing up on you. Yeah. And then, see, that's that top lip being firm and that drawstring and the corners around the mouth being the tension and no tension on that bottom jaw and bottom lip. Right. Pushing up on the on the reed. Right. And see there, that's that bird, that Domish classic bird. You see the little dimples, and, and you can tell his top lip is like iron. And and I think that's it, man. And Sonny, you know, I did uh, do some gigs with him. And like Sonny did or not, you, everybody's got to admit he's a hell of a saxophone player. Mm -hmm. And he really did know that that's not accident. This cat really was a scientist with how he thinks about shit. Mm -hmm. I remember I played a gig with him, and he said, "Let me play your horn, you know, because he's really arrogant." You know? mm -hmm. let, me, let me, let me, let me, let me play. He played it. And he played one note on it. And said, "Oh no, that'll never do." Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I meant like, well, "What do you mean?" He said, "Your, your setup is way too hard." Mm -hmm. He said, "You can't do that. That's from a song, so sorry like violin. Play mine. Just, I just want you to feel this." Mm -hmm. And I played one note, man, before I could even get the note out. He snatched the horn out of my mouth. <laughs> he, didn't, he didn't want me to play no more than one note. Wow. And he said, okay, that's enough. Now he said, I just wanted to let you know how easy my setup is. Yeah. And, and you think about that. And then here's what it was, man. I, first of all, I had played, you know, earlier in the set with him. I've never, I never would have thought listening to him that his read was that soft. Mm -hmm. I never would have thought that. Yeah. That's number one. And then he said, listen, you got to learn how to play a soft read and learn how to be in tune and control it. And once you learn how to do that, you do not have to have a three or four. You, you, you Because the, the, the softer read is more flexible. You're going to get a better resonance and uh, it's not going to work here and you, it, the whole stuff is better. Mm -hmm. You just got to know how to not squeeze and be, you know, bite down hard and learn how to play that, and then get the mouthpiece that does that well for you. Mm -hmm. And then I, but but I could not believe how easy it was. It was like Jesus Christ, man. I, so I think I've been for years been kind of wrong with, with things. You know? Well, I, yeah. So anyway, long, long story short, that soft to read. I bet you recorded better too. Well, that yeah, that's always the thing, Charles. Where I really notice it, you know, when I hear it back if I've used a softer read I usually have better results because I have more of a quick response um, yeah, see, there you go right, there you go but and see when you play gigs you tend to be a little harder than you need to be because you're playing a gig and it's live yeah and you're worried about projecting over the drummer and uh, you know noise good room noise and, right and then we tend and plus alto seems to be even critical with that man mm -hmm. you know where we tend to worry about if we're too uh, too wimpy, you know. Right. But see, tennis players don't give a shit about none of that. They only worry about being wimpy. Right. Or their upper race. See, the horn plays itself. Right. Really. And you get any kind of mouthpiece on there and blow air through the horn, they're going to get a decent sound. Right. And they, their upper register is not because they got a big wide pipe. Mm -hmm. And they don't have none of that shit to worry about. Yeah. 
and they don't either. And that's one reason why a lot of people think tenor players play better than alto players. That's not really true. That when it is, it's easier for them to get a flow on the damn horn. Yes. That's what's easier. Yeah. It's not that they're smarter or they got a bigger brain or they've got more music. None of that. It's the horn is less resistant. It's buzzing more, and they got a bigger pipe, and and they, they it's just easier to get a flow going. Where at least they can, it's easier for them to connect their ideas and not have resistance. Just easier, and yep. then they don't sound as bad. It's not as a bitchy. You know what I mean? Yes. And a big, fat, warm sound right in the middle of the piano. Yeah. They don't have nothing to worry about. I know. It's just a more forgiving instrument on every level. Yeah, yeah. And they don't have to have a, a New York Meyer, you know, it's called $1,200. They don't have to have that. Right. They get some little mouthpiece that's not too big or small, and, put, and that blow through the damn thing, and that's it. Right. Anyway, well, okay, I'm gonna let you talk. I'm gonna let you add, but we'll talk. And then well, I'm, I'm gonna, well, this is great, man, because you know the the first person who really, you know, you you opened my eyes on so many levels. Um, but um, you know, I always tell people a story when I first met you. You came into Augie's when I was 17. It was one of the first gigs I ever did in my life. Yeah. And and you came up and talked to me, and you were so kind and supportive. And then that led to a number of years where, you know, I hung out with you quite a bit and, and yeah. you know, you stayed with me those couple times in Eddie Locke's building. It was like two weeks apiece. And I mean, I learned more those those couple times that we hung out for a couple weeks. That that was just like extended masterclass about music, about life. And I, I, I will want to get into that a little bit. But the first place I wanted to start out with was I wanted to ask you about coming up in Detroit. Um, you know, when, when you did and, and, and the associations there that, that kind of, um, you know, I, I mean, I know that you had an association obviously with Barry Harris and Lonnie Hilliard and some other folks, but I just wanted to ask you about your early musical days coming up in and around Detroit. Yeah. Okay. Well, this would be like, uh, early fifties, you know, and, uh, I, I just, I was very fortunate. I moved from Joplin, Missouri when I was nine years old. Mm-hmm. It's like 1948. So I moved to Detroit with my mother. My mother had relatives already in Detroit. So we were able to, you know, move there and stay with, you know, get with relatives until we got on a beat. I just happened to live on the street. It just shows you how uh, fate is or if you believe in that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. I just happened to live on the same street as Lonnie Hillier, mm-hmm. right down the street, and he's my age. And happened to live right down the street from the Bluebird. Yeah. Which is, was a real famous uh, local jazz club. Mm-hmm. So when I first moved there, now this is, I'm nine, ten years old, I'm not playing sax, I'm not playing music at all. Mm-hmm. I connect up with Lonnie, he's not really playing music, so we're just kids playing on that street. Mm-hmm. Now, er, later, let me see, about 12 and 13, then I got in the, what you call junior high school, I got in the band and played trumpet first. Mm-hmm. Trumpet and flugelhorn first, because I didn't have a. I wanted to play saxophone. I didn't have one. And the, the school did not have any available. They were, everybody was already playing them. You know. mm-hmm. uh, Lonnie was playing trumpet. I was playing trumpet. I played flugelhorn for about a year, and then I got an alto. I, I, my mom bought an alto, and then now this is what I really want to do. And I'm still like uh, maybe I'm 13. I don't really know about. Uh, a lot about jazz. I mean, you know, there are a couple of jazz records in the house. Everybody had in those days. Uh, but I didn't know a lot, and I started getting books with Johnny Hodgson's, okay. And uh, I knew who he, kind of knew who he was, because Duke Ellington was famous. And I could get the books and look at it and listen to the records, and they were interesting to me. And then a, a, little, a guy had played tenor, who was maybe a year older, said, well, that man, you should check out this cat, Charlie Parker. Now, I didn't know who Charlie Parker was. I didn't know how he looked. I know nothing. I said, okay. Uh, I'm about 13, 14. And then I'm in this uh, candy store and I see a jukebox and I see Charlie Parker on there. I say, oh, this is who this guy told me about. Let me put my money in and check this out. And then I put the money in and it was Charlie Parker playing Tico, Tico. Hmm. I'll never forget. And when I heard that, I'm like 13 or 14. Mm-hmm. It's like, that's it. Now, I didn't know anything about 251s, harmony. I knew nothing. Mm-hmm. 
I didn't know much about jazz at all. I knew nothing. And when I heard that, immediately it resonated. I understood it. I, to me, it was like, man, whoever this guy is, this is it. Yeah. And then I started investigating. It's like, man, who is this Charlie Park? What is this? Mm. And then I find out. And then I find out that, oh, well, Charlie Parker is just one member of a whole group of musicians who sort of play this way. Now it's like, well, what is this kind of, what is this? And they say, well, you just kind of, it's like bebop or it's progressive jazz or modern jazz. There's a whole slew of people that kind of play this way. And it was like Bird is kind of the, 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 the dude. You got, but you got Dizzy and Miles. You got people like Stan Getz. You got people like uh, Chip Stan Kenton, uh, Max Roach. You just got this whole group of young players that are playing this kind of way, some sort of way. Mm -hmm. And then from that point on, it's like, okay, I want to learn everything about everybody that plays this kind of music. Mm -hmm. and what this music is and then I just started buying records now at this point I find out I'm like 14 and 15 that the jazz club that this club down the street features this kind of music all the time mm. and man when I found that out it was like okay I'm gonna go down there and start I just I'm, I'm 15 I can't uh, go into clubs but I, I hang out outside and listen now, here's who the house band was. Elvin Jones on drums. Wow. Pepper Adams playing the baritone. <laughs> Thad Jones on trumpet. Wow. Barry Harris playing piano. Mm. And different bass players from different, you know, sometimes it might be Paul or somebody else. Mm -hmm. uh, this was the house band. Wow. And at one point, the owner let me come in with my parents on a Sunday afternoon, and the band, that's who they were, it was, it was Pepper, and I'm like 14, 15, and I could not believe it. Wow. And from that point on, I'm there every night, uh, people like Pepper Adams and, and Billy Mitchell worked there all the time, this is when Miles was working there and living in Detroit for a couple of years almost, mm -hmm. uh, and, and this was, was his home was at the Bluebird Mouses, at the Bluebird every night. Wow. Playing with Pepper and Elvin and Barry Harris. Hmm. And this is the kind of stuff I heard at 15 and 14. Um, so I sat in, and, and Ron and I sat in, we played Star Eyes, and we knew how to play the melody. Mm -hmm. But I couldn't play chess. I had not a clue what the hell chord changes were. Hmm. Ronnie was a little better, a little smarter than I, because he had a piano. Mm -hmm. I didn't have a clue. And then, but we sat in and we could play the melody good. Good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but when it came to soloing, it was total gibberish. Yeah. And Barry said, well, you can't, you, do you know anything about, uh, it, 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 no, I don't know. And he just happened to live around the corner, five minutes from me. So there it is, the best club in town and the, one of the greatest musicians. And especially with showing people harmony and all that stuff. Barry has five minutes from my house. Wow. And he said, well, come on, you gotta, you gotta know it. You can't play this kind of music, man. It's not, you can't do it. You gotta know, you gotta know. Mm. And then he just showed me, he just showed me about Diamond Seventh. And uh, his house at that point was a very, very kind of hold, held open court in his house. He had a nice gig at night at the Bluebirds. So he was working for a steady, that gig would last three or four years. You mm. know? So he had a nice gig, the money is good, decent, and in the daytime, you know, he just had all day to practice and hang. Mm. And his, so his house is kind of like open court for musicians in Detroit mm. in the afternoon. Anybody would come, and during the course of, anybody's coming in there, so Sonny Red, uh, the, the, uh, Roy Brooks, uh, Paul Chambers, anybody that's coming through town working uh, at Detroit someplace, they knew Barry like open court and they'd come by his house so at any time there would be people like Sonny Rollins over to Barry's house I remember being like four, 15 years old here's Sonny Rollins wow. and Barry they would, they would just get a chair and sit down by the piano and, and they would play 
John Coltrane play. Mm. Because he's working with Miles, right? Yeah. He comes by Barry's house and he he gets a chair and he sits down and he says to Barry, I read the poems. He says, Okay, what are you working on these days? Mm. I'm tired of playing like I play. I'm getting so that all I'm doing is playing mix and I'm just shuffling mix around. Mm. And I'm kind of tired of that. What are you doing? What are you thinking of? How are you, think, how are you thinking about harmony? You know, just what are you, and I, I remember him asking Barry that. And I remember Barry saying, well, I got a couple of young students and then I'm one of them, me. That I'm, I'm trying to find a way and I'm teaching these guys. And me, I'm, I was like a main student kind of. I'm mm-hmm. so close to him, dear Crabber. Mm-hmm. It's that I, I'm learning things about how to teach people and what's the fastest, best way for them to understand and actually have them play. And I'm beginning to understand that this whole thing of two fives, two five ones, really, it's really five one. Mm-hmm. And the two is necessary for the piano players to play. Hmm. And the bass players, but for horn players who are running who are running, and it's almost, they can, don't think, be so concerned about the minor two chord, mm-hmm. and be more concerned about five, because five is where you're going to go anyway, mm-hmm. and it's going to be one that's next, and five has all the harmonic goodies with the upper extensions. Mm-hmm. So, instead of thinking A minor seven to D seven, and worrying so much about A minor seven, know that it's there, Know that the notes that give you more of a minor sound if you want that. But really, be thinking more of the dominant of where you're going because you're going to go there. Mm-hmm. And that's where all the higher extensions are. And if you're playing two beat changes, by the time you take a breath, the two card is gone. Right. So the five is it. And trains seem to be very impressed with that. Hmm. Very impressed with that. And then they played. And I tell you, man, I really think. And then Barry said, listen, you can play while the piano player is playing a two minor two chord. Mm-hmm. You can be playing one, three, five of the dominant. And that will sound exotic and sound good. Right. And I, I, you, and you can. It's like a very weird sound. That's odd, you know. Mm. And... Uh, and if you listen to Train, not long after that, when he was into his motor and Miles and him were playing, you know, a minor, you know, something like that, you know, minor seventh car for 16 bars, you, classic Train is playing the dominant chord on top of that minor seven. Mm-hmm. With the third being very much featured. Mm. You understand? Yeah. Now, if you went to the piano right now, and in your left hand played, say, an A minor seven. Mm-hmm. And with your right hand, you play a D7, like a D, F sharp, E, uh, and C on top. Mm-hmm. As long as it's above middle C, mm-hmm. you would get that sound that we're talking about. Mm-hmm. Have you ever done that? Yeah, I, I've, I've had some of that kind of thinking. And then, and then if you... If you keep going up with the upper extensions, then you start to get a little bit... It almost... You get a little bit of a polytonality kind of thing in a way, too. Yeah, but if you... That sound, that's a classic sound, that's a classic train sound, hmm. is really the minor two being played. And he's playing almost like he's just playing the dominant seven stuff. Yeah. And he's, he's really... And it even sounds good on the piano as long as the dominant seven is up an octave. Yes. Or two octaves. And so you get this very exotic sound where you're getting a minor two sound, mm-hmm. but you're getting this extended because the the, 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 the root of the dominant seventh is, a, is, a, is a, an eleventh, you know, a, mm. in relation to the minor seventh chord. Right. And then, see, the only thing odd is the F, like the, the third of the dominant seventh. It's an odd note. But see, that note sounds good up an octave. Mm-hmm. And see, there it is. Hmm. And I, I bet money some kind of way, because Train was one of these guys who was a real seeker yeah. of what people were, what are you doing? He was always, what are you doing? Hmm. 
And I think he took that and said, I can see something with this, and I'm going to do this. And he might take something from somebody else, but I think he definitely got something to bury on that. Yeah. And I heard Barry play Countdown at John Steps once. Yeah. Uh, on, and the way Barry played it, it's like, you know what? And he played it good. Mm-hmm. It's like, you know what? I, I don't hear cats play John Steps like that. You know, they play more, Pat Barry plays it more like he's playing, I got rhythm, he's just playing the right shit. Hmm. Yeah, rhythmically, you know, people tend to sound like, very, they really do have to spell it because you don't have time to play nines and elevens because it won't sound right. Mm-hmm. So you really, you only got two beats to sound right and you, and it's fast. So you got to choose, so in, most guys, they end up playing the tune and, and they are even fr- afraid to take a breath. Yep. You take a breath, you didn't talk to you know? yeah. so you come back in, you got to come back in with the right chord, because, and you might come back in where you only got one beat of that chord. Right. Okay, so if you breathe and just play like you're playing of any other tune, it's harder to play that way. So it's easier to play and keep your place. With John said, if you almost play it like an A2. Yeah. Or, or like an exercise. You end up doing babu doo be doo be doo. Da ba boo doo ba da ba da be da. You end up doing the same shit over and over. In fact, Train ended up doing the same shit over and over again. Yeah. And he stopped playing. I mean, if you notice, he didn't play it no more after a while. Right. You don't hear him playing it live too much. Mm hmm. Because it's hard to actually, it's like, okay, I, you, once you learn to do that, okay, what's next? How do you, where do you go with it? It's like, you know where to go. You know? Yeah. Uh, except what do you do? Start holding notes, finding common tones, and then playing the rhythm like uh, instead of playing like a bunch of eighth notes and no rhythmic, uh, uh, th- you know that that's really hard to play. Mm. That, that like like that. Oh, let's put it this way: if Sonny Rollins, with his rhythmic schematic and the way he plays, played the Countdown of Giant Steps, then you would hear what I'm talking about. Yeah. See, that wouldn't be the same way Train would play that. Mm-hmm. And it wouldn't be the way a thousand of tennis players play it either. Mm-hmm. And it's a lot harder to play like that with the rhythm like that or syncopated shit and starting the phrase, of, you know, with that ability with, with, with turn, you know, the, the curveballs all the place. Much harder to play like And then breathe anywhere you want in the, in the form. Right. And remember where you are and then do that shit and connect that shit up. Yeah. Hold a note here and there. And then run. Mm-hmm. That's hard, man. That's yeah. The Barry, I heard Barry complain that once. He kind of did it like that. It's like, man, shit. People think they. Yeah. But anyway, that was the musical climate mm. in those days. And you had a lot of players that played. Thad Jones played well, man. Mm-hmm. Uh, he could write. Uh, Pepper Adams played well. Mm-hmm. And he, you, you can't. Can't beat Pepper. You cannot beat him. You mm. can't beat him. I mean, that's it. And this was uh, there were people like uh, Frank Foster were there. Hmm. And Frank Foster before he joined, uh, uh, you know, Count Basie and all that stuff. He becomes just kind of section cat. Mm-hmm. Frank Foster played good. Oh yeah. Yeah. On the early records with Art Farmer, he played good. He sounded just as good as early Train. Mm-hmm. He sounded. Good. Yeah. Well, those cats were playing in Detroit, and that so that environment was the environment in in Detroit, John. In those days, in order for you to play, be considered hip, you 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 you'd have to not only be able to play and understand people like uh, say Bird, for instance, you would have to understand people like Stravinsky and shit. Yeah. And Hindemith and um, Bach, you'd have to have that whole shit. And not only that, that's with music. You'd also have to be a person who could talk about philosophy, uh, who, who could talk about Nietzsche, yeah, um, uh, Schopenhauer. Uh, I used to listen to Barry Harris and uh, Pepper Adams. You know, just talk about it. people come over. And, Barry's house, and, and sometimes the conversation wouldn't be nothing about music at all. Mm-hmm. It would be about uh, about philosophy and, and philosophical thought, right? And uh, cubism about painting, right? They talk about all this shit. They talk about Hindemith, uh, Edgar Varese. Right. It would be all kind. 
it was like Jesus Christ. So in Detroit, it could be considered what you would say, like hip. Mm -hmm. You not only could have to know about bird and shit like that, mm -hmm. but you have to be able to talk about philosophy. You'd be able to talk about painting, Marx, and all literature. Yeah. Uh, you'd have to be able to be a, a, what we call it, you know, kind of like a hip motherfucker. Yeah. You'd have to be hip like, you had to know all that shit. Well, you know And what? then you would be, could walk around like you're hip. <laughs>